Welcome to another world after coronavirus. I am really happy and honored uh, for this special episode uh, because there is a special guest joining us uh, today. And that special guest is not only mine, but a hero of many generations. Uh, both of us are unfortunately in self-isolation, so this is also a very special uh, occasion. Uh, but without further introduction, I think most of you who are watching this know who is Noam Chomsky. Uh, and I'm so glad that Noam is joining us uh, today. Uh, hello, Noam. Could you just tell us where are you? Are you already in self-isolation and for how long? Well, I'm in Tucson, Arizona, uh, in self-isolation for the time. So, uh, you wrote, you, you were born in 1928. And you wrote uh, your first essay, as far as I know, uh, when you were only 10 years old, uh, which was an essay on the Spanish Civil War, uh, actually just after the fall of Barcelona. Uh, so that was 1938, uh, which looks very far away for my generation. Uh, you survived uh, the Second World War, uh, Hiroshima. I mean, you were a witness to Hiroshima. Uh, you were a witness to many very big, important political, historic events uh, from the Vietnam War uh, to the oil crisis uh, to the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, before that, you were a witness to Chernobyl. Uh, after that, uh, in the 90s, uh, you were a witness uh, to, to a historical moment which was leading uh, to 9-11, which was also a global event. And most recently, I mean, I'm trying to really uh, shorten a long history and a lifetime of, of someone like you. Uh, but the most recent event was the financial crash of 2007 and 2008. Uh, so in this background of such a rich life and being a witness and also an actor uh, in these uh, major historical processes, uh, how do you look at the current uh, coronavirus uh, crisis? Uh, is it an unprecedented historical event? Uh, is it something which surprised you? And how do you look at it? That, that would be my question. Well, I should say that uh, my earliest memories, which are haunting me now, are from the 1930s, uh, the article that you mentioned on the fall of Barcelona was actually mainly about the apparently inexorable spread of the fascist plague all over the all over Europe and where it was going to end. I later, much later, discovered when internal documents came out that the analysts of the U.S. government at the time and in the following years expected that uh, the war would end uh, with, uh, they knew a war was coming, that a, a war would end with uh, the world divided into a US dominated air region and a German dominated region. So my childhood fears were not entirely out of place. And those memories come back now. Uh, I can recall uh, when I was a child, young child, listening to uh, Hitler's Nuremberg rallies over the radio, I couldn't understand the words, but you could easily understand the mood and the threat and, the, and so on. And I have to say, when I listen to uh, uh, Donald Trump's rallies today, it resonates. It's not that he's a fascist, he doesn't have that much of an ideology, he's a sociopath, but an individual concerned with himself. But the mood and the fear is similar. And the idea that the fate of the country and the world is in the hands of a sociopathic buffoon uh, is uh, shocking. The coronavirus is serious enough, but it's worth recalling that there's a much greater horror approaching. We are racing to the 
edge of disaster, far worse than anything that's happened in human history. Uh, and Donald Trump and his minions are in the lead in racing to the abyss. Uh, in fact, there are two uh, uh, immense threats that we're facing. One is the growing threat of nuclear war, which uh, has exacerbated by tearing what's left of the arms control regime. And the other, of course, is the growing threat of global warming. Both threats can be dealt with, but there isn't a lot of time. And uh, the coronavirus is a horrible uh, plague, can have terrifying consequences, but there will be recovery. Uh, the others, there won't be recovery. It's finished. If we don't deal with them, we're done. And uh, the, so the childhood memories are coming back to haunt me, but different dimension. Threat of nuclear war, we can get a sense of where the world really is by looking uh, to early to this January, as I'm sure you know, every year the doomsday clock is uh, set with uh, the minute hand a certain distance from midnight, which means termination. Uh, ever since Trump was elected, the minute hand has been moving closer and closer to midnight. Uh, last year was two minutes to midnight, the highest, matching the highest it ever reached. This year, the analysts for, uh, dispensed with minutes, started to move to seconds, 100 seconds to midnight. That's the closest it's ever been, citing three things, uh, the threat of nuclear war, threat of global warming, and the deterioration of democracy, which doesn't quite belong until you think about it, but it does because that's the one me hope that we have for overcoming the crisis. An informed, involved public taking control of their fate. If that doesn't happen, we're doomed. If we're leaving our fate to sociopathic buffoons, we're finished. But, uh, and that's coming close. Trump is the worst, but that's because of US power, which is overwhelming talk about U.S. decline, but you just look at the world, you don't see that. When the U.S. imposes sanctions, murderous, devastating sanctions, it's the only country that can do that. But everyone has to follow. Europe may not like, in fact, sanctions on Iran, but they have to follow. They have to follow the master or else they're kicked out of the international financial system. Now, that's not a law of nature. It's a decision in Europe to be subordinate to the master in Washington. Other countries don't even have the choice. Uh, and uh, back to the coronavirus, one of the most shocking, harsh aspects of it is the use of sanctions to maximize the pain perfectly consciously. Iran is in has its own enormous internal problems, but uh, by the stranglehold of tightening sanctions, which are consciously designed openly to make the suffer and suffer bitterly now. Uh, and you know, Cuba has been suffering from it from the moment that it gained independence, but it's astonishing that they've survived, but they stay resilient. And one of the most ironic elements of today's coronavirus crisis is that Cuba is helping Europe. I mean, this is so shocking that you don't know how to describe it. That Germany can't help Greece, but Cuba can help European countries. If you stop to think about what that means of all our civil words fail, just as when you see thousands of people dying in the Mediterranean, fleeing from countries that Europe has devastated for centuries and being sent to the deaths in the Mediterranean, 
you don't know what words to use, uh, the uh, crisis, the, the civilizational crisis of the West at this point is devastating to think about. And it does bring up childhood memories of listening to Hitler raving on the radio to raucous crowds uh, adoring him at the Nuremberg rallies. Uh, you wonder, begin to wonder, is this species even viable? Uh, you mentioned the crisis of democracy. Uh, at this moment, uh, I think we find ourselves also in a historically unprecedented situation in the sense that almost 2 billion people, that's a figure I found today, uh, are in one or the other way confined at home, uh, whether it is isolation, self-isolation or quarantine, almost 2 billion people in the world uh, are at home, if they are lucky enough to have a home. Uh, at the same time, what we can witness is that uh, Europe, but also other countries closed their borders, not only internal ones, but outer borders. Uh, there is a state of exception uh, in all the countries we can think of, uh, which means curfew in many countries, such as France, Serbia, Spain, Italy, and other countries, army on the streets. And what I want to ask you as a linguist uh, is the lang language. Uh, which is uh, now circulating around. If you listen, not just to Donald Trump, if you listen to Macron, uh, also some other European politicians, uh, you will constantly hear that they speak about war. And even the media speak about doctors who are on the first front line. And uh, uh, the virus is called an enemy, uh, which reminded me, of course, also not to childhood memories, luckily, but a book which was written at that time, uh, Victor Klemperer, uh, Lingua Terzi Imperi, the book which, uh, which is a book about the language of the Third Reich and in which way through language the ideology was imposed. So from your perspective, uh, what does this discourse about war tell us? And why do they present a virus as an enemy? Is it, is it just to legitimize uh, the new state of exception, or is there something deeper in, in this discourse? In this case, I think, I don't protect the rhetoric, but I think it's not exaggerated. Uh, it has some significance. The meaning is that if we want to deal with the crisis, we have to move to something like wartime mobilization. So if, if you think of uh, take a rich country like the United States, it has the resources to overcome the immediate economic crisis. Um, mobilization for the Second World War uh, led the country into far greater debt than is contemplated today and was very successful. Mobilization practically quadrupled the U.S. manufacturing, ended the Depression left the country with an enormous debt, but a capacity to grow. Now that's a lesson we need, probably not on that scale, it's not like the Second World War, but we need the mentality of a, of a social to try to overcome the short run crisis, which is severe. Uh, how severe, we don't we can recall the swine flu uh, epidemic and 2009, which originated in the U.S., that killed a couple hundred thousand people in the first society recovered, recovered from worse. Uh, but it has to be dealt with. That's a rich country like the United States. Of those two billion people, uh, the majority are in India. What happens for Indian living hand to mouth? who's isolated, starves to death, uh, what's going to happen? Uh, in, in a civilized world, the rich countries would be giving assistance uh, to those who are in need instead of strangling them, which is what we're doing. 
particularly in India, but in much of the world. But uh, the, the crisis, you know, whether the crisis can be within a country like India, I don't know. Bear in mind that uh, the with current tendencies, if they persist, South Asia is going to be unlivable in a few decades. You know, the temperature reached uh, 50 degrees C in Rajasthan this summer, and that's increasing. Uh, the water is running out. Uh, it could get even worse. There's two nuclear powers there who are going to be fighting over uh, restricted, reduced water supplies. I mean, the coronavirus is very serious. We can't underestimate it. But we have to remember that it's a, a fraction, small fraction of major crises that are coming along. They may not disrupt uh, life to the extent that the coronavirus does today, but they will disrupt life to the point of making the species unsurvivable and not in the very distant future. So we have many problems to deal with. Uh, immediate ones, coronavirus is serious, has to be dealt with, uh, and much larger ones, vastly larger ones, are looming. And there is a civilizational crisis. We have to, it's a time, possibly good side of the coronavirus, is it may, might bring people to think about what kind of a world do we want? Do we want the kind of a world that leads to this. And we should think about the origins of this crisis. Why is there a coronavirus crisis? It's a colossal market failure. It goes right back to the essence of markets, exacerbated by the neoliberal, the savage neoliberal uh, intensification of deep social economic problems. It was known for a long time that pandemics are very likely, and it was understood, very well understood, that they are likely to be coronavirus pandemics, uh, modif slight modifications of the SARS uh, epidemic you know, 15 years ago. Time it was overcome. Uh, the, the viruses were identified, sequenced, uh, vaccines were available, uh, labs around the world on, could be working right then on developing protection for potential coronavirus pandemics. Why did they do it? The market signals were wrong. The drug companies, we have handed over our fate to private tyrannies called corporations, which are unaccountable to the public, in this case, big pharma, and for them, uh, making new uh, body creams is more profitable than uh, finding a vaccine that will protect people from total destruction. Uh, it would have been possible for the government to step in. Going back to wartime mobilization, that's what happened. Uh, polio at the time, I can remember very well, was a terrifying threat. It was ended by the discovery of the Salk vaccine by a government institution set up by the Roosevelt administration. No patents you know, available to everyone. Uh, that could have been done this time, but the neoliberal plague has blocked that. We are living under an ideology for which economists have a good bit of responsibility, so it comes from the corporate sector. An ideology which is typified by uh, Ronald Reagan uh, reading the script handed to by his corporate masters with his sunny smile saying, government is the problem, let's get rid of government, which means let's hand over decisions to private tyrannies that are unaccountable to the public. On the other side of the Atlantic, uh, Thatcher was uh, instructing us that there is a society just uh, individuals thrown into the market to survive somehow. And furthermore, there is no alternative. The world has been suffering under this years, and it's now at the point where 
things that could be done, like direct government intervention on the scope of the invention of the soap, of the Salk vaccine, but that's blocked for ideological reasons coming out of the neoliberal play. Uh, the point is that this coronavirus uh, epidemic pandemic could have been prevented. The information was there to prevent. And in fact, it was well known in uh, October 2019, just before the outbreak, there was a large scale simulation, high level simulation in the United States and the world of a, of a possible pandemic of this kind. Nothing was done. Uh, the, the crisis was then made worse by the, uh, I don't know what word to use, the treachery of the political systems we didn't pay attention to the information that they were aware of. On December 31st, China informed the World Health Organization of uh, pneumonia-like symptoms with unknown etiology. A week later, they identified, some Chinese scientists identified it as a coronav coronavirus. Furthermore, they sequenced it and information to the world. By then, virologists, others who were bothering to read World Health Organization reports, knew that they were coronavirus and they knew how to deal with it. Did they do anything? Well, yes, some did. The countries in the China, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore began to do something. And they have sort of pretty much it seems contained at least the first surge of the crisis. In Europe, to some extent, it's happened. Uh, Germany, which had, uh, which had, which hadn't moved to the just on time, the uh, idiocy of hospital systems under neoliberalism, did have spare diagnostic capacity and was able to act in a highly selfish fashion, not helping others, but for itself at least, to have a reasonable containment. Other countries just ignored it. The worst were the, the United Kingdom and the worst of all was the United States, which happens to be led by a geopathic lunatic who says, you know, one day there's no crisis, it's just like flu. The next day it's a terrible crisis and I, I knew it all along. Uh, the next day we have to go back to business uh, because I have to win the election. Uh, the idea that the world is in these hands is shocking. But the point is that it started with, a, again, a colossal market failure uh, pointing to fundamental problems in the socioeconomic order made much worse by the neoliberal play. And it continues because of the collapse of the kinds of uh, institutional structures that could deal with it if they were functioning. Uh, these are topics that we ought to be thinking about seriously and thinking in more depth about, as I said, what kind of world do we want to live in? Will overcome somehow, there will be options. Uh, the options range from uh, installation of uh, highly authoritarian, uh, brutal states, all the way over to radical reconstruction of society on more humane terms concerned with human needs, not private profit. And we should bear in mind that highly authoritarian, vicious states are quite compatible with neoliberalism. In fact, the gurus of neoliberalism, from Mises, uh, Hayek, uh, the rest, were perfectly happy with massive state violence as long as it supported what they called sound economics. You know, we shouldn't forget that neoliberalism has its origins in 1920s Vienna von Mises' seminar, von Mises could barely contain his delight in the proto-fascist Austrian state and smashed the labor unions 
an Austrian social democracy and joined the early proto-fascist government and praised it, praised fascism in fact, because it was protecting sound economics. When Pinochet uh, installed a murderous, brutal dictatorship in Chile, they loved it. They all flocked there, Milton Friedman, I just, uh, to, to uh, help out with this marvelous miracle that was bringing sound economic and great profit to a foreign and a small part of the population. So it's not an, it's not out of, uh, it's not uh, outlandish to think that savage neoliberal system might be reinstalled by self-proclaimed libertarians with a powerful state violence imposing it. That's one, you know, uh, pop, it's one of the nightmare that might come about, but not, it's not necessary. There is the possibility that people will organize, become engaged, as many are doing, and bring about a much better world, which will also confront the enormous problems that we're facing right down the road. The problems of nuclear war, which is closer than it's ever been, and the problems of uh, uh, environmental catastrophe from which there is no recovery. Once we've gotten to that stage, it's over. And that it's not far in the distance unless we act decisively. So it's a critical moment of human history, not just because of the virus, but that is bring us, should bring us to awareness of the profound flaws, the word flaw is not strong enough, the deep uh, dysfunctional characteristics of the whole socioeconomic system which has to be if there's going to be a survivable future. So this could be a warning sign and a lesson to deal with it today in order to prevent it from exploding, but thinking of its roots and how those roots are going to lead to more crises, worse ones, unless we extirpate right away. And since we don't have much time, uh, I'll just pose one last question. Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, I think many people are interest, interested and also us who are active in social movements um, uh, and mobilizations and organized for decades uh, using, using physical and social closeness between people. Uh, but now suddenly we are all uh, getting accustomed to what is now being called social distancing. Uh, so my question is, how do you see the future of social resistance in times of social distance? And uh, if this takes a few more months, not to mention maybe a year or two, uh, and we are mainly in self-isolation or at home, uh, what would be your advice uh, to progressives around the world, activists, also intellectuals, students, workers, how to organize in this new situation? And could you perhaps uh, tell us whether you see a hope that instead of going into a global authoritarianism, this open historic situation might go in a radical transformation of the world, which would be green, uh, equal, just, uh, and full of solidarity. Well, first of all, we should bear in mind that in the past few years, there has been a form of social isolation, which is very damaging. Uh, you go into a McDonald's say, and take a look at a bunch of teenagers sitting around a type table having a hamburger what you see is two conversations going on. One, a sort of shallow discussion among them. Another, the one that each one is having on his cell phone with some remote individual who he's a friend. Uh, this is 
atomized and isolated people to an extraordinary extent. The Thatcher principle, there is no society, uh, has been uh, escalated by the misuse of social media that has turned people into very isolated creatures, especially young people. There are actually universities now in the United States where the sidewalk have uh, plaques on them saying, look up, because every kid who's walking around is glued to his cell phone. That's a form of self-induced social isolation, which has been very harmful. We're now in a situation of real social isolation. It has to be overcome by recreating social bonds in whatever way can be done through need of whatever kind there can be, helping people in need, contacting them, developing organizations, expanding organizations, playing getting them to be functional and operative, making plans for the future, bringing people together as you can do in the internet age uh, to join, to consult, to deliberate, to figure out answers to the problems that they face and work on them, which can be done. It's not face-to-face -face communication, which for human beings is essential, but you're going to be deprived of it for a while. You can put it on hold, find other ways, and continue with the and in fact extend and deepen the activities carried out uh, can be done. It's not going to be easy, but humans are faced with those problems in the way. Can I pose a question since we are both in self-isolation? My dog this is trying to have a conversation. <laughs> but was that before a parrot? Or do we have a bird as well? Or a parrot? Or a bird. There was a sound of a bird. Yes? Parrot, but a bilingual parrot. It can say sovereignty to all the people in Portuguese. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> Great. Thanks it a has, lot, Ron. It has better wisdom than we hear from Washington. Thanks a lot, Noam. I think this is a beautiful ending uh, uh, of this conversation. I hope we will talk soon. Uh, we will all stay at home and we will wait for you and your parents to tell us when to get out of our apartments and make a revolution. <laughs>